the conference of PONAS. My name is Marlene Larel. I'm the director of the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies here at the Elliott School of, for International Affairs, GW, and I'm the co-director of PONAS with my two colleagues, uh, Professor Henry Hale and Professor David Zacconi. Our uh, program on new approaches on research and security in Eurasia is a network of about 150 scholars, both from North America and Eurasia, and it has been generously funded by Carnegie Corporation of New York for more than 25 years, and we are very grateful for their support and for uh, uh, GW support. As you can imagine, it has been a tough semester for uh, uh, all of us, but as you can see, the network has survived and is probably now one of the only remaining institution where you will find Ukrainian and Russian uh, uh, colleagues still interacting and dialoguing with, with each other. The, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has been really a tectonic plate type of shift for the world uh, region and what remain of the post-Soviet world seems to be really disintegrating fast now with repercussion effect in the Caucasus and on Central Asia and I think we will see unfolding events happening as we speak uh, uh, today. We will be discussing all that and much more during uh, our today's uh, event. We will have two plenary sessions in that room in the morning, and then we will break out for two different, so four uh, breakout sessions in the afternoon. And by speaking today at our conference, all our speakers express their condemnation of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and call for the restoration of uh, Ukraine sovereignty. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Professor Henry Hell, who will be chairing the first panel. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, the first panel today is focused on uh, obviously the central event, uh, Russia's war on Ukraine. And uh, we are very happy to have many of Ukraine's leading scholars here to uh, join us in this discussion. Um, and uh, especially thankful that so many of them could come here in person. Um, it's just great to see everybody um, to talk about these uh, important events. Um, so I think we, we have actually only one speaker who is uh, virtual, and that is Volodymyr Dubovic from Odessa Meshnikov National University. So um, just uh, to make sure that the internet doesn't let us down um, at some point, I think we'll start with him. And then other than, beyond that, we will go um, in the order of um, the, the panelists that are listed here. So that would mean uh, after uh, Volodymyr, will be uh, Paulina Sidevets, uh, also from Odessa Mechnikov National University, uh, followed by uh, Alexei Haran from uh, Kiev uh, Mohila Academy National University, um, and then Tatiana Malyarenko from National University Odessa Law Academy. And uh, we're very grateful also to have uh, Melinda Herring, Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council, uh, who will be offering comments on um, what's being presented here. And um, basically that is uh, kind of a lead into saying that the um, typically uh, presenters here are also authoring uh, policy memos, uh, so you can find, if you're not familiar with it, a series of policy memos on our website, phonosurasia.org. Um, they're, they're memos of about 2,000 uh, words in length, uh, five, six pages typically, um, and so uh, they have uh, drafted memos and uh, have, have, have shared them, uh, in this case with uh, Melinda. And uh, so your feedback will also be very useful uh, for those memos that have not yet been published. So you'll find some have been published in advance of the conference, but some are still uh, in progress. And I think all of us are still working to try and understand uh, these important events and, and what should be done. Um, so even for a published memo, obviously the discussion is very important. And to facilitate the discussion, uh, we generally ask speakers to, uh, even though I think each one of them could fill an entire day easily uh, with um, information and insight that would be useful to us to uh, basically present for about eight minutes of the most important points they want to make. Um, and then if we do that, we'll have plenty of time for discussion and interaction when you can ask them to address topics that they um, uh, haven't yet addressed or follow up on the other points they made. So let me uh, turn now to the speakers. And um, so the first one, as I said, will be uh, Vladimir uh, Dubovic is at Odessa Mechnikov National University, and he'll be joining us online, so. All right. Hello, hello right. everyone. Henry, can you hear me? Yes. Good, Hi. wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, <clears throat> dear colleagues, uh, this war has been a very tragic event, obviously, for everyone here in Ukraine. So uh, I hope that I wouldn't be breaking too much of a decorum if I suggest that we take a short moment of silence in memory of all the victims of this war, if you don't mind. Thank you.
Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I mean, it's really personal for not just me, but for 40 minutes of Ukrainians, as you understand. This is big time. I mean, today, of course, it's also a very specific moment when some uh, statements have been made in Kremlin, I've been told, as we expected them to be. So uh, very special time for us to have this panel, frankly. I mean, I don't uh, susp suppose that uh, organizers thought something about uh, Mr. Putin's plans to actually start the conference at the exact time when, when he is making those statements. But um, no, jokes aside, and of course, there's nothing funny about that. Uh, this is a very special conference opportunity for me to speak to the family of scholars uh, to which I belong for 20 years this year. I've been uh, uh, allowed to join uh, Poners, invited to join 20 years ago. So it's a very special conference for me. I mean, obviously, it's a very special conference for, since we didn't have any uh, during COVID time. So it's the first uh, non-virtual conference, except for me, because I do belong to this uh, category of people, men between 18 and 60 in Ukraine. So I could not be with you, unfortunately. But uh, in uh, my thoughts, uh, in my soul, in my mind, I am with you, my dear colleagues. Let me say a few things about U.S.-Ukraine relations, so Ukraine-U.S. relations for that matter. I mean, uh, definitely U.S. in the driving seat in many ways, but uh, having said that, without Ukrainian heroism and resilience, there would be no Ukraine but, uh, as we speak right now. I mean, obviously, so whatever we might say for a good reason, uh, how Americans and others uh, helped us along in this uh, recent seven months, uh, Ukrainians are carrying the the burden and uh, you know having you know feeling the brunt of the whole situation and the whole assault. I mean uh, the, the the strategic partnership that was actually reproclaimed or reintroduced uh, you know late in the summer, early fall last year. So about a year ago, when Zelensky visited Washington, finally uh, is having a, its final test of the moment. Like uh, what is it all about, and do we actually have strategic partnership? And of course, never in our thirty plus years of uh, relations between uh, U.S. and Ukraine. We had such a, an intensive agenda and so much cooperation and interaction. I mean, basically, I mean, our ministries and agencies are working together in many as myriad ways and connections in there, primarily in military, but not just military, because of course, the US is not just giving us weapons or money to buy weapons, but also humanitarian assistance, assistance to keep our government afloat. So, so the people would have, uh, you know, their salaries, their pensions on time. So there's so many facets to what uh, US is trying to help us and diplomatically and uh, many other ways. So, and also thinking beyond the war, like what's gonna happen about recovery in Ukraine, what's going to happen about the security arrangement for Ukraine in the future? Will be there some kind of security guarantees that have been discussed now? Will they be viable? Uh, that's something that is also on our minds. Even now, as we still have this war on our hands, it's far from being over, unfortunately, but we're already thinking beyond that because also we understand this is not going to be when it's going to be time for a peace fire or peace deal. It's not going to be the time when the Russian aggression against Ukraine ceases once and forever. So we need to think about our security. And of course, the US has a certain a very specific role in it. Prior to the aggression, the massive aggression on February 24th, of course, was a very interesting period, a uh, complicated one uh, because Americans were raising alarms. And all, uh, those alarms are not, were not properly heard in, in, in Kiev or misinterpreted, in my view, probably. Uh, why is that the case? Uh, I actually blame Trump, you know. <laughs> I've been studying for years of Trump in the White House and his impact on our bilateral relations. And of course, we remember 2019, when his blackmail operation on Zelensky was the first thing Zelensky saw from the US when he became president. So that led to trauma, uh, frankly, quite frankly. It, it led to a very serious trauma uh on uh, on on Zelensky's mind in his inner circle and the lack of trust trust was 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 uh, the victim and it was damaged trust between the countries Zelensky actually learned the lesson that Americans can play their games with Ukraine not necessarily having Ukraine's interests at their heart so that was a lesson unfortunately and that's why when he heard so certain uh, you know alarm uh, alarming uh, uh, warnings about incoming imminent aggression uh, he thought that maybe, well, maybe it's not true. Maybe Americans are playing certain games. I mean, using Ukraine as their game vis-a-vis -vis Russia or something like that. And also, of course, the Americans were not themselves quite sure that Putin would for sure 100% attack Ukraine with all this army uh, gathered on our border. So uh, many of our, as we know, many of American allies, closest allies even, uh, were not sure as well. So uh, there were doubts. And uh, But primarily, it's, it's Trump and trauma of Trump. And also, Trump has a double meaning, uh, because right now, of course, there is also Trump who is around and his wing of the Republican Party. 
which has a clear chance of getting more votes in the Congress in the upcoming uh, elections in early November. Uh, I personally hope and think that they would not have an upper hand and majority uh, and uh, therefore the, the, the by, the by um, branch, or should I say, uh, policy, uh, executive and legislative uh, towards Ukraine wouldn't change just because of them getting more votes. But it is a threat because, of course, it's exactly them who are primarily uh, you know, questioning now if uh, necessity uh, uh, of helping Ukraine and how long should it go and how much money should be given and it should be there any conditions put on it and so on. So since February 24th, obviously, we are living uh, life, this life together in many ways. I mean, uh, in many ways, it's become Biden's war. I mean, he invested so heavily in supporting Ukraine, stopping Russia, in undermining Russian influence and helping Ukraine to sustain its sovereignty, at least. And so far, he's succeeding. I mean, we've been through ups and downs in this war in the recent seven months. Uh, there have been times in the, in the spring, even after the Kiev withdrawal and Chernihiv withdrawal of Russian troops, when there was some kind of a euphoria that, like, Russia is losing right away. You know, we are winning and Russia is losing. They've been defeated. And that was request, re, re, reflected, actually, in, in many statements by, say, Secretary Blinken or Secretary Austin. Uh, but then, uh, you know, we went through a very hard and bloody summer, so we're now much more cautious. And we're also aware that there is discussion within this administration, which is, uh, you know, mostly thinking in, the same, in sync in many ways uh, along about Ukraine, because it's a group of people who have personal trust in Mr. Biden and they're, you know, they have a similar conceptual background behind their understanding of foreign policy. But at the same time, it's different people, live people, and, uh, you know, and they have discussions. And uh, there's probably something in the National Security Council, which is not necessarily reflected, but why people at state or, or Pentagon thinking about what should be done, how far should they go? And of course, the discussion now about the escalation. You know, what do you do about escalation? Uh, I think the recent events and what we see today in Moscow is actually an example of how I understand the escalation. You don't give Ukraine attacks, attacks you don't give them tanks, you don't give them uh, fighter plane, planes and so on. And uh, Russia sees this as a, as a sign of, of, of weakness, you know, and they escalate. So that's my understanding of escalation. You actually keep up the pressure. You don't even let up pressure on Russia. And that's why that's when they don't escalate. If you show them that, okay, we gave Ukrainians some high marks and so on. Uh, so it's, of course they're much more battle capable, um, combat capable and battle cap capable now, uh, but we're not gonna give them more or in, in, a, in a bigger numbers on massive scale, then uh, you know, then you're actually uh, pushing Ukraine, I mean, Russia to do more escalation because they begin to see the certain red lines and Putin was a very capable always. Even before he ceased to be this well-known rational player and become this very emotional and ideological player that he became since February 24th, uh, still he's been known to understanding where his red lines are, and he needs to be reminded about them. So Russia needs to be reminded about them. With what they're doing today in Kremlin, uh, the need to not let Russia win and not mm -hmm. let Ukraine lose is even more important. It's even more significant. And of course, it's not just interests and values in play for Ukraine, it's for, for the entire Euro Atlantic space, it's for US. Like I said, if US leadership that we're seeing today, which is unprecedented in many, many times or decades, we haven't seen anything like that. Uh, you know, looking back to the months prior to February 24th when the Biden administration started uh, building this coalition of pro-Ukrainian states and anti-Russian sanctions and, and working the, the infrastructure of routes of delivery of weapons sure. to supply to Ukraine and so on. Uh, we haven't seen anything like that. It's, it's a clear redemption after Afghanistan. It's showing people what American leadership actually means in today's world. And uh, it's a chance for US to actually be a real superpower and a leading power in the world. So if they, if they lose this war somehow with Ukrainians, it would be tragedy not just to us here in Ukraine, but also for Americans. Speaking about the future, and I conclude here, not to break the time, uh, abuse the time limits. Uh, the future is uh, not bright, obviously, because there'll be more fighting, there'll be more blood. Uh, both sides here, Ukraine and Russia, are not ready to stop fighting, obviously. Russia definitely with partial mobilization, you know, with these declarations and uh, the so-called referendum, declarations of today, statements in Moscow. Uh, Ukraine as well, because the mood is there. Of course, it's hard war. We're losing our guys, best and brightest. Uh, it's very hard in our economy, obviously. But we cannot just stop and give up and surrender, not after Butcher, not after Izum, not after we lost our guys in the battlefield. 
Okay, so therefore, and also if we just stop and give up and give some concessions, that would be an invitation for Russia to do more in the future and Putin to do more in the future. So everyone in Ukraine understands that. It's not just about political elites or experts, it's also about public. If you look at sociological poll, you have this amazing numbers like, you know, high 80s or, or you know, low 90s of people who are against any territorial concessions. We need to understand that because Zelensky is living, I mean, he's super popular, he's a rock star today, but he's living in a real, political situation there, unlike Putin, he has a position, his parliament, his media to deal with, he has public to deal with. If he suddenly announces that he's given up land, Ukrainian land to Russia somehow, uh, that would be a very difficult situation for him politically and his ratings will just drop down very quickly and he doesn't want to do that as well. So that's another factor we need to keep, keep in mind. So I'm afraid that we are in for more fighting and uh, that's why uh, for our American friends, it's very important to keep sustained uh, the support that been upcoming or incoming into Ukraine and keep the coalition going and uh, keep the Rammstein group as we call it informally here in Ukraine, the contact uh, group on defense of Ukraine uh, and many other initiatives ongoing. Uh, we have a big coalition of countries helping us in various ways. This contact group I mentioned, I think it's 50 countries the last meeting had it. I mean, obviously some countries give us more, some give us less, but everyone is giving us something. So, and of course you have this resilience, which you didn't expect many of us from Ukraine. Frankly, I didn't expect it. I mean, I criticize our government for many years for being sometimes incompetent and corrupt, but it seems to me that since February 24th, it's working better than ever before. So, uh, and that's because you have this resilience in the, in the society, in the country, and people are not giving up the fight. So in this fight, we have in Americans, our, our friends, our allies, our brothers, and, and therefore I believe in a brighter future in a longer term perspective for US-Ukrainian relations. There will be a strategic partnership tested, coming stronger out of this uh, trying times. Uh, and there will be some kind of guarantees, I think, some kind of uh, assurances, uh, not the Budapest Memorandum 2, but something more viable. We don't need Budapest Memorandum 2, we need something more viable that um, perhaps Washington and Kiev will come up with and a certain uh, you know frame, time frame, maybe with others being involved, but, but of course Ukraine understands that in the longer term it's asymmetric conflict still with Russia. Russia is much stronger. They have resources. They have nukes. So we need uh, help of others, sustained help uh, in in the coming months and years and maybe even decades. And thank you. Okay, thank you, Volodymyr, from uh, for joining us uh, from such a long distance. Um, our next uh, speaker will be uh, Polina Sinivets from Odessa Metchnikov National University. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Vladimir, for your brilliant speech. I'm very impressed. It's really hard to talk up to you. It has always been and uh, it will be uh, always for me. However, the good thing is that Vladimir uh, has prepared the soil for my talk because um, Today it happened, uh, Putin accepted uh, the annexation of uh, Ukrainian territories uh, as the territory of Russia. And therefore, it opens a very um, dangerous page of history for us, from my point of view. Um, today, we are going to speak about the possibilities of Russia's escalation, not in the political, but in the military way, um, in the process of um, Russia war against Ukraine. Um, well, the easiest um, way which we now can see uh, what is going on is that um, actually Putin, uh, having joined um, the part of Ukrainian territories to Russia, Putin has uh, admitted um, the high, his highest resolve to defend these territories with whatever means, as he said on the 21st of um, uh, September this year. And of course, this opens a long range of uh, options of uh, different kinds of escalation from the side of Russia. And it shows, first of all, uh, the strengthening of the terms. It shows the higher resolve of Putin to do it by whatever means. From my point of view, um, this is a game of a chicken for Putin. By doing what he did, he actually closed the door for the way back. And this is a very bad news for us. So um, but let me give you a couple of words about the basics of Russian military doctrine and the possibilities of uh, using nuclear weapons in, um, in different situations. Uh, so actually what we have now uh, started uh, after the war in uh, Yugoslavia when Russia had the feeling of uh, parallels 
between itself and Yugoslavia, between its regime and the Yugoslavian regime of Milosevic. And therefore, the military doctrine of 2000 actually proclaimed the possibility of using nuclear weapons in the regional war. The regional war defined by the war with Russia and its neighbor when the third power interferes, and also to the possibility of using nuclear weapons to de-escalate the conflict, so actually to de-escalate the interference of the first, uh, third power. Um, since uh, then, you know, long time has passed, and uh, even speaking that uh, the nuclear, the, the military doctrine of two, uh, 2014 uh, said that um, Russia is going to use nuclear weapons only in response of, uh, if, if its uh, existence is uh, in jeopardy. Um, there is also, actually not, nothing has changed since 2000, because the range of possibilities to escalate for the escalation remains, and now we are seeing this. The main question between 2000 and 2022 was, what does it mean the existence of the Russian state? Because before, it was interpreted as the existence of Putin regime. It was interpreted as Russian territorial integrity, but it has never been interpreted as Russia waging uh, the invasion of the other state and covering with nuclear deterrence as the umbrella against any kind of other interference and defending the, uh, and defending the that, that state which is attacked. So um, now we have the situation of using nuclear deterrence in, the, in and of using that situation in a very different uh, terms and at the same time complying with the basics of Russian doctrine. Because um, by proclaiming war against Ukraine, Putin at some point mentioned, noticed that this is the existential threat for uh, Russia because NATO is expanding via Ukraine. So it's a proxy war. And therefore, by not starting the war, uh, Russia would undermine its future existence. So now, by having joined uh, that territories of Ukraine, the next territories to the territory of Russia, actually, uh, Russia raised the state because now we are speaking again about the sovereignty, of, not the sovereignty of the state, but the territorial integrity, which is um, included in the foundations of Russian nuclear deterrence of 2020, saying that the main aim of Russian nuclear deterrence is uh, uh, to preserve Russian territorial integrity, sovereignty, uh, Etc. So now Russia has showed it uh, as the integral part of its nuclear term. So it just included in the Russian nuclear term perimeter. So the question is uh, under what circumstances Russia can use nuclear weapons? Uh, on my point, it's still not, no, of course, it's not the uh, option number one, because the option number one is the mobilization, which Putin relies on and uh, which he. Uh, Hopes will succeed at some point um, in the course of war, but uh, what if not? What if um, Ukrainian Ukrainian forces would uh, go on with counterattacking Russian territories? Can it be uh, the pretext of for using nuclear weapons? Yes, it can, because uh, again, if we look at the foundations of Russian nuclear deterrence, we can see that one of the key points of uh, Russia using nuclear weapons is um, the disruption of the key military infrastructure, which is responsible for the response action. Uh, therefore, any kind of um, military attacks over Crimea uh, or over um, uh, Russian military forces deployed near Ukrainian borders can be interpreted by that kind of attack. Uh, and this can be one of the first scenarios how Russia can use nuclear weapons. Uh, tactical nuclear weapons, of course, there are a lot of uh, opinions and considerations on how and where and uh, how it can be done. I don't want to, uh, of course, play on this, uh, but on my consideration, it would never be something insignificant. It would, if, if it happened, it, it, it would happen only um, to make some kind of public noise, to coerce uh, NATO to step back from supporting Ukraine, to coerce Ukraine to sign, uh, to sign the treaty, uh, agreeing and adopting that kind of annexation. The question whether it will succeed or not, this is still an open question. Um, also, there is one more possibility of one or more scenario when Russia can uh, use nuclear weapons, and it's uh, probably a small uh, deliberate uh, situation when uh, Russian, because there is one more uh, case when Russia can use nuclear weapons, is when a Russian early warning system can detect the um, launch of ballistic missile from the territories of the rival states, uh, no matter what kind of uh, warhead is, uh, conventional uh, or nuclear, 
um, Russia will still uh, retain the possibility of nuclear response. And that is why um, any kind of malfunction of Russian early warning systems now uh, can be, uh, or not the malfunction, but the way it will be presented by Russian authorities can be, again, uh, can that end up with the launch of the PS strike. Uh, again, I don't think that this is uh, somehow very probable scenario. It's not, but the tension is very high, maybe one of the highest moments uh, and the critical moments since uh, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I would say that even it's even more critical because now uh, it's a war which can escalate to the other level and that level can be nuclear. So maybe I will stop here and answer your questions better than um, overburden you with the other information. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Um, so our next speaker will be uh, Alexei Haran from uh, National University B of Mohila Academy, uh, who will be presenting uh, a memo in progress uh, that's co-authored with uh, Petro Berkovsky from the Democratic Initiatives Foundation. Thank you. 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 But also for, but also for the support, um, but also for the support to Ukrainian scholars in this difficult time. Okay, when we invented first the title using nuclear option, we meant actually indirectly as a means to solve a problem, right? But because we prepared this man memo more than a month ago, but now we have we hear the threats from. Putin, and frankly speaking, it's very nervous situation in Ukraine right now. And we are checking Google for web links to the articles how to behave during during nuclear strike. So this is the reality how we live now in Ukraine, not only on the front line, but also in the capital and other cities. Two weeks ago, I returned from the front line where I was on humanitarian mission as volunteer, and I also use this possibility to interview many soldiers directly in the trenches, and at that time I put them questions, so what will you do, how would you react if there would be a nuclear strike? And everybody was saying that we will continue to fight. Uh, can we trust it, what soldiers are saying? So let me give you one example. Uh, this is a question from our poll of Democratic Initiative, Initiatives Foundation, which was done in, the, in December. And the poll is shown, the question was, how will you react to, uh, to Russian aggression? What will you do in December? Okay, so 22% said there will be no war. But 20% said we will take arms and we will fight. Additionally, more than 20 percent said that we will support Ukrainian army in the, any possible way. So we are not going to take arms, but we will support. We presented it to all Western organizations, to diplomats. It was open. And still, the West didn't believe us. Many people in the West, they thought that Ukraine will survive only for two, three days. And the most important thing, Putin didn't believe this polls. Or maybe he hasn't seen this poll. He hasn't seen this poll because you know there's a problem for communication between him and reality, I would say. <laughs> That's true. So uh, Russian, so, so believe Ukrainian sociologists and believe what Ukrainians are saying. So this is very important. Now I would like to, oops, how, next, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, <laughs> now let's talk about how Ukrainians see the future. So, first of all, 92% of Ukrainians believe in Ukrainian victory. And this figure is more or less stable since the beginning of the war. We put additional question: what do you understand by Ukrainian victory? So 55% said restoration of our territorial integrity. Okay, so this is official line of the government and it's supported by Ukrainians. Additionally, 
21%, they think more radical, that it should be defeat of the Russian army and stimuli for split up, or break up of Russia, which we consider as Russia, which this part of Ukrainian society consider as Russian, small as Russian empire. So, frankly speaking, I'm not sure if it's realistic, and we discussed it yesterday with my colleagues. So I am sure that this is up to Russians and those ethnic minorities who are living in Russia to decide what will be the future of Russia. This is not the task for Ukrainians. Again, our official aim is to restore our territorial integrity. Nobody is going to attack Russia. But it shows the moods in the society. And the more atrocities we see from the Russian side, the more Ukrainian society would be radicalized. And we should remember that Kremlin propagandists, they said that it's necessary to distract the whole Ukrainian nation. I would, uh, I would quote infamous article, which was on Kremlin rule on Ria Novosti uh, with a statement, te Ukrainianize Ukraine, te Ukrainianize Ukraine. The country should be split in different states, with pseudo states with no name Ukraine in the title. So this is an official uh, official uh, Russian website. So this article I would give to every scholar to read. It's translated into English, very good to understand the essence of what Russia is trying to do with Ukraine. Now, let's come to uh, potential reaction of the West. First of all, uh, the Western reaction, we are talking since 2014, was inadequate. If there would be enough sanctions and support to Ukraine, I'm sure there would be no full-scale war. But um, Putin saw the Western actions as a kind of invitation. The West is weak, the West is split. So I can go, I can go for now. Definitely Western position changed after this full-scale war. And I'm saying that we should be thankful for everything the West is doing for us, specifically the United States. We have this kind of lungs in here every day, every day. And so it's not something surprising for us. Surprising for earlier schools. Wow, this is Putin's reaction. <laughs> now, now, actually, actually, now, yes. So you know how to do so to do it. We should pause. Yeah, I can pause. I'm sorry, we yeah we have to evacuate hopefully not for too long, uh, going outside and probably exiting the building, crossing the street in the park because the world. Tell everyone online, it will be back. Yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> All right, uh, so we apologize for the uh, disruption. Um, and just as I mentioned before, we're going to uh, work straight through the coffee break. Um, so we'll have maybe a five minute transition between panels. So um, you know, feel free to get up and get some coffee then. Um, but I think now we should just go ahead and continue because uh, I know uh, Melinda unfortunately has to leave at 1045, but we'll still have time for her uh, comments. Uh, but let's let Alexi uh, finish up. Then we'll turn to uh, Tiziana Malyarenko and then uh, we'll have time for Melinda's comments. And then um, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and have like a uh, discussion time and eventually uh, you know, eat into the lunch period a little bit, but we should still have time for lunch, uh, maybe a half hour instead of an hour, and then hopefully we can get back on track. So, um, Alexia. Yes, so now you have a feeling what does it mean to have a long, um, a long in Kiev, air lungs, and we have it every day, actually, in Kiev. On a positive, uh, on a positive note, Ukrainians are optimists, you know, so, uh, we do not have to go, we are not bombarded here, and we do not uh, go to shelters. So that's what uh, is the usual thing in Ukraine right now. And also, it confirms that we need anti-missile system, anti-aircraft system. We do not have it. Russians are bombarding our cities. Fall 2022 test of GW, S emergency communication system. In addition to annual testing of its <laughs> yes. So 
still, you know, we appreciate all the Western support, but we do not have enough for protection of our cities, not to say to have enough weapons, weapons to continue counter offensive to liberate our, our territories. Regarding potential compromises and uh, Volodymyr and uh, Polina have already talked about that most Ukrainians rejected. So you see that only 9% uh, are ready for concessions on Crimea, 7.5% for the status quo as of February 23rd. Even in this case, these people will consider it as a victory, but majority decline all these concessions. And it's steady position of the Ukrainian society. So, because I hear, I hear many, uh, many questions from Western scholars, expert journalists, when finally Ukraine will be tired and would be ready for compromises on the territorial integrity. It doesn't happen. So that's maybe it goes against some psychological laws, but this is what Ukrainians demonstrate. Uh, so any compromises on this issue would definitely undermine support of Zelensky government. And also it will stimulate, as it said before, it will stimulate Russia for further, for further aggression. Uh, some things are very, some compromises actually are very, um, how to say, dubious. For example, on grain export. Okay, so now we have grain export from Ukraine and Poland, which is good. But by the other hand, Russia continues to bombard Ukrainian ports on the south, so it continues, you know. So we cannot on the one hand export grain, doing good for many countries in the world who face food crisis. And at the same time, we continue to live under these bombardments and after the acts of aggression. Now, what is the future? So uh, some security arrangements. Uh, you know, now there are negotiations, it's called the Irmak Rasmussen Commission and also the Irmak McFall Commission on Economic Sanctions. Uh, there is a talk about the things under strange title, Kyiv Security Compact. Who knows what does it mean? So it's a kind of guarantee, kind of guarantees provided by different countries at different levels about supply of weapons, economic sanctions, but not about direct protection of Ukrainian skills. So uh, definitely we think, again, this is good, but this is not enough because we know what happened with what happened with Budapest memorandum. And in order to defend our country, we will need, and I will borrow the term from Maria Amelicheva. Here, Fortress Ukraine. Fortress Ukraine means that Ukraine should be provided with necessary arms to be strong. And as we are saying in Ukraine right now, the only guarantee of Ukrainian security is Ukrainian army. Ukrainian army. At the same time, uh, Ukrainian public and also officials continue to support joining NATO. This is very important because at some point there was a flirting with the idea of non bloc status, if there are some guarantees. Now it's rejected. It's totally rejected by the public opinion and also, the government followed, uh, followed uh, the public opinion. And finally, maybe just several things, what we are fighting for. So Ukrainians are not fighting only for territorial integrity and for freedoms. Ukrainians are fighting for democracy. This is very important. So 64% believe democracy is the best choice for Ukraine against 14%. This is a striking result, I believe. I'm not sure if in the United States there are such kind of polls, <laughs> what would be the result. But this 64 against 14% and the rate of support for democracy is the highest now. So during the time, there could be some question about, you know, what would be the fate of Ukrainian democracy is a threat to monopolization of power. I will be happy to respond about it to respond and I will show you, we put also provocative questions. Are you ready to exchange freedoms for the well-being? Some freedoms for the well-being. So 30% of respondents, they said, well, in some cases, yes, we are ready to sacrifice some of our freedom. But 
47 percent said no and very important trend the higher is your education the more likely you are to reject the limitations of freedoms even for the sake of your well-being which i think is very positive positive thing thank you very much sorry for the alarm <laughs> Um, so let's now turn to Tatiana Malyadenko from National University Odessa Law Academy. Thank you very much. And uh, Putin, uh, today and tomorrow may be topic starter for my presentation because I will be talking about occupied territories and the de facto state and occupied territories as a leverage of Russian influence in Ukraine and how this leverage change uh, during the conflict. So uh, the question of a referendum of status of uh, occupied territory was also uncertain. And we even could not say what happened yesterday or today because Russian policy changed. And it was not clear in the beginning of war in 2014, what will happen with uh, Donetsk and Lugansk and Crimea scenario was discussed for several times regarding these territories and the question of referendum on new occupied territories, which I uh, named the Kersovan and Zaporizhia, it was uh, discussed and changed for several times, referendums <coughs> were postponed and it was option as we can know from uh, open sources, that uh, part of territories, for example, Donetsk and Lugan, will be kept as uh, de facto states, and uh, the Parisia and Kherson would be directly annexed. So this decision to conduct a referendum was very quick and uh, would bring to us a lot of uncertainty. And of course, we should not consider referendum seriously. And we were laughing about yesterday's formulation of Putin's decree when he said that he would uh, recognize independence of the Perugia Oblast. <laughs> and uh, he, he mentioned United Nations chapter and the right of people for self-determination. What is the people, Ukrainians who live on the Perugia, what is their right for self-determination? Of course, it's very funny if we look at on this referendum. But I found at least uh, six reasons why we have to study this question seriously and uh, not to focus on the referendum itself as the informational operation of Russian propaganda to shift attention from defeat of the Russian army in the region and today's defeat in the north of the Donetsk region when the uh, Russian 20th Army is surrounded by Ukrainians and Ukrainians promise that it will be compensation for Ilovaisk tragedy when the Ukrainian army was surrounded by Russia. So I can name at least six reasons why we have to study these referendums in the context with the other factors. So the first reason is the obviously move to uh, escalation. So referendums are accompanied with the decision on mobilization. And if we put in line all events starting from February 2022, we will see that there is a path rather to escalation than to de-escalation. In particular, the uh, recent Nord Stream 2 incident. So uh, referendums is the cover for decision on mobilization. And of course, uh, if uh, public, it was announced in public that it will be 300,000 of Russian soldiers uh, mobilized it, and about this 300,000 escaped to Kazakhstan and Georgia, we can say that it will be more army, really number who will be mobilized than uh, three, uh, three, 300,000. So now, according to official Ukrainian uh, statement, Ukraine mobilized at least 1 million of men and women, but Russian offensive forces, it's about 200,000, uh, 230,000. 
plus, of course, mobilize the population of Donetsk and Lugansk people in public, whom nobody calculates how many of them are mobilized. So in order to keep the advantage, Ukraine need also to additionally mobilize troops. And we have some evidence that this our center of complication, they already started to enroll more, more mobilized to go to the army. So the increase in quantity of armed force, it's of course the pass toward the escalation. The second reason, which is linked to the first one, so war is the rather war of attrition. So it will, it is a war of resources, when the manpower, the vehicles, the economic resources will uh, play for the victory of party. And now both Kiev and Moscow, of course, we don't know about some hidden negotiations, some rumors said that they took place, but again, we don't know about them. They uh, openly declare the goal of war is to destroy the statehood of the opponent. So at least the public statement, we in Ukraine believe that Russian state collapsed. And uh, Putin said that Ukraine does not exist, so the end of war will be the collapse of the Ukrainian state. So it's a zero sum game when the parties will attract more resources. It's also about the occupied territories because both human potential of occupied territories and economic potential will be used for the war. And we know that uh, men from uh, Donetsk and Lugansk are mobilized to join Russian army, and there is some evidence that some attempts take place uh, to mobilize population in Kherson and Zaporizhia, at least uh, when they uh, will be in recognized at the Russian territory. One very sad or uh, not very sad fact about this war, so according to Putin decree all people who are registered on this territory in the time of recognition, they are automatically considered as the Russian citizens. The same was in Donetsk and Lugansk in 2014. So for example, I have Donetsk registration because I was born there and I had the registration in Donetsk in 2014. And if government of the Donetsk People Republic would like to consider me to, to some extent in criminal investigation, for example, they will consider me as a citizen of Donetsk People Republic. That uh, tells us a lot of about the character of this war because it's a very colonial empirical war in, from feudal rule. When you capture a territory, you capture it together with population and you don't ask the population where they, the people want to live, but you just consider them as your subordinate, you, your vassals. So uh, the population in Kherson and the Parisian region could be mobilized to fight against Ukrainians, and we know that some attempts to do that exist. About economic resources, Ukrainian government said that for the next year, about 80% of money collected from tax, 80%, will be spent for security and defense. So it will be a very big cut of expenditures for social service, for education, public health, etc. So it will be a budget of war, where almost all resources will be mobilized for the fighting. On the Russian side, we know also there are some policies to uh, rebuild the economy, to be uh, to make it more economy of war. And territory of occupied Kherson and the Parisian region will be used for this purpose. And um, uh, I will be very brief without numbers. It's very interesting research of Canadian sex death analytical think tank published by Washington Post. They assessed uh, the resources which are located in the occupied territories of Zaporizhia and Kherson. It's very rich land, agricultural land, and uh, rivers, water resources, and seaports, and the natural minerals. 
So comparing to Donetsk and Lugansk, it's very valuable asset to Russia. And uh, we are moving to the third reason, uh, is the change of Russian policy from political leverage, from opportunism to strategic calculation. So Donetsk and Lugansk People Republics were used as a leverage to impact the decision of Kiev in foreign policy, domestic policy. Now there is absolutely different policy. Russia wants to keep this valuable uh, territory. You have shown as a bridge, as a land corridor to Crimea, it's a water supply to Crimea. It's a very valuable agricultural land. We and Ukraine immediately absorb how our market change it because we don't receive the fruits and vegetables from her soil. So it's very good, very, very, very valuable land. And uh, it's uh, also some secure ge geostrategical uh, corridor to the Crimea. And uh, we are moving to the fourth reason is uh, I call the trap of hybridity. We wrote a lot of article about hybrid war, and we say that it's a more human war with the low intensity conflict, just uh, with few killed combatants and civilians, and most operations are in information and economy, but we can observe how hybrid war collapsed, how this concept collapsed in the uh, course of the war. And Russia moved from hybrid war because hybrid war was not able to um, achieve, uh, to, to help Russia to achieve its goals in Ukraine. It moved to special operation, small professional army. It's a kind of colonial war where small professional army enters the territory and want to capture. And now the next step, it's mass uh, conscri conscription. So it's absolutely different time of type of war. I would say it's more traditional to Russia than the hybrid or the small professional army. But what behind of that, that many tactics which Russia used during the hybrid war in Donetsk and Lugansk, it employed now in Kherson and Zaporizhia. And uh, why we did not pay so much attention to this hybrid uh, tactic, to violation of human rights in Donetsk and Lugansk, to mass uh, political repression, to secret prisons, to this mass graves. It, everything what we watch on TV now, it was uh, eight years ago. But because not so many, much attention was paid, now we can see it's more in this, uh, this, this form. And we're moving to the fifth reason is the weakness of international organization. So it's uh, very close to that. Weakness international organizations, it, we, we have a lot of evidence from Mariupol when Red Cross, International Committee for Red Cross was blamed for not organizing humanitarian corridor to Mariupol. And the uh, prisoner exchange failed, but I would not like to blame the personnel of organization, but rather to mandate of organization to deal with uh, the conflict. So the role there should be changed. And final reason, is the policy of Ukrainian government over the occupied territory. We was asked not to criticize Ukrainian government uh, a lot, not to give food for Russian propaganda, but I will uh, tell just a couple words that Ukrainian policy toward the occupied territory is very confusing. On the one part, we have Irina Verishuk, who is deputy prime minister, who said that uh, it will be a criminal investigation of civilians who live there and cooperate to some extent with uh, Russian, who take part in referendum, who take Russian citizenship from five to 10 years in the prison. On the other hand, we have uh, prime minister Dinesh Mughal, who brought a bill to the parliament. It was not so public, but you can find this uh, draft of law on the site of uh, Ukrainian uh, Rada. And uh, in this bill, he proposed to decriminalize a lot of, of activities of Ukrainian citizens who live in unoccupied territories. So it will be legal if the uh, bill will be adopted to uh, have a business, to trade, to uh, teach at the schools. So this absolutely two different direction of policy. It was not public discussion, 
But I can guess the government consider that adoption that occupy, occupation will be take place few months, and occupation will take place uh, several years. And uh, they discuss uh, different options how government should uh, to deal. And very finally, final that what we can discuss maybe next conferences, how um, fail of uh, implementation of Minsk agreement, generally peace talks for these eight years, uh, favor the current war. Uh, it was uh, the case of agreement themselves, or <laughs> me, wrong mediators, wrong format, or some set of strategy of Russia and Ukraine. So it's an open question for our future discussion. Thank you. All right, and uh, finally, we have I'm sorry, I have some comments comment regarding Middle East. Well, yeah, I think Melinda has to go with like. 1045. So we've already squeezed her oh, right okay, up to okay, the okay. end. So let's let's get her uh, comments. So apologies for uh, doing so. Offer what comments you can, and then we can um, return to the discussion. Super. Thank you so much to Poners. I'd like to thank uh, you and your team, and particularly Sarah. Can we give her a hand? She put tons of time. Thank you so much, Sarah. This is a brilliant conference. I, it's really an honor to be on on this panel with great Ukrainian scholars, and uh, I think these papers are terrific. Uh, Tatiana, I'm going to start with your paper. I would give you an A. I think you, and that, that's the highest mark I can give you in the American system. I think you have nailed it. And you say uh, on page four, Russia is maximizing power by increasing direct or proxy control over these territories. That is it. Uh, you've done a great job. I think the paper, the only weakness I can see of your paper uh, is that it would be helpful if you were a little bit more speculative. So what does annexing uh, Kherson and Zaporizhia mean for Ukraine. I'd like to see a paragraph or a section on that. Will Putin take more or can he stand back after he's annexed these two territories and push for negotiations? That's the only weakness I can see in your paper. And to all my friends in the audience, if you can grab a pen, I would like to invite you to read Andre Kirchhoff's book, Gray Bees. It does a great job of explaining that everything Tatiana has just said in narrative form. It's a wonderful book and it's just been translated very well into English. Okay, next up is Polina. Polina, uh, you are, this is an excellent paper. Polina's paper is on uh, nuclear weapons. She said, this is a game of chicken. Yes. Uh, Putin has closed the door uh, to turning the heat down. Yes. Uh, you said nukes are not uh, his only option. So my question to you is, what does Vladimir Putin gain by using tactical nuclear weapons? I don't see anything he gains. And I think the big question you don't answer, because you're an academic and will forgive you, is will he? So if you talk to the policy community in town uh, and you, you put a gun to their head and force them to give you a number, they'll tell you if there's a 5% chance that he'll use nuclear weapons. We should have a discussion about that. There's a lot of uh, related questions. Will the generals follow his orders? Will the weapons work? Have they been tested? We don't know the answer to these questions. So we're playing a lot of uh, speculative criminology once again. Uh, I think you also need to acknowledge that Vladimir Putin has been making these empty threats about using nuclear weapons for years and years and years. You don't acknowledge that in the paper. And most analysts think that this is a sign of weakness and that this is one of the only cards left he has. I think your paper would benefit from, <clears throat> yeah, and it would benefit from, from, from being more explicit that this is an old tactic. Uh, and it's, I think it would also benefit from saying, I think it would also benefit from saying that uh, almost all the nuclear powers have told him to stand down as well. So that, that's sort of a, a footnote, but I think this is an excellent paper. It's an absolutely excellent paper. And it's very well written, so congratulations. And I really enjoyed reading what, it. What is the mark? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get back to you. <laughs> I, I, I haven't marked the others. Okay, uh, my, my friend, Mr. Haran. Uh, okay, your paper was written before mobilization, so you need to go back and update it uh, in line with all the changes we've seen. Uh, let's see. Uh, I agree with you. You outlined all of these public opinion statistics, and uh, you said no one understands Ukraine. I'm not an academic, so I'm going to be even more direct. Uh, the reason that we got everything wrong. The reason that the analytical community in the United States got their predictions wrong, that Ukraine is going to fall in, in three days, uh, that the Russian army is 10 feet tall and the Ukrainian army is two feet tall, is because there is so little expertise on Ukraine in this town. Uh, most of us who went to Georgetown and George Washington 
you, these are wonderful universities, were trained by Russianists. We were, did not study Ukrainian and we did not study Ukraine. So our predictions were wrong. Uh, and hopefully, I think this is uh, where it's going to uh, inspire more students to learn Ukrainian, to learn Ukraine, and to realize that there's a massive amount of difference between Ukraine and Russia. So hopefully, we're going to catch up, but forgive us. Uh, we uh, did not do very well when you look back about the assessments. Uh, number three, let's see. I, I'd, like, I'd like your thoughts, I would say, on does Russia have a way out now? So now that he's annexed uh, these two places, uh, is there any way for him to get out of this? Uh, number four, if Russia <clears throat> doesn't get, so your, your paper basically says, uh, if the West doesn't give Ukraine sufficient weapons, uh, Ukraine is in a very ter terrible uh, place. So if Ukraine doesn't get sufficient weapons, you need to follow through on this. What does the conflict look like? And you really need to game it out. Uh, I think in the second section of the paper, uh, you could game it out a little bit more. And then a uh, fifth point, this is stupid and minor, but I think your your um, argument would be strengthened if you used a KISS data that says that 82% of uh, Ukrainians say, we will not give an inch. We do not care if it, uh, if, it if it's if the war goes on, but uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, do not give an inch. Uh, the, the figures you gave are, are great, uh, but use a bigger number. It, it, it shows 82% is really hard to quibble with. Mm -hmm. But it's an excellent paper. Okay, okay. my plus. <laughs> <laughs> my friend Volodymyr, it's great to see you. I wish we, I wish you were here. We missed your presence. Thank you for taking a moment uh, to recognize uh, the sacrifice and courage of Ukrainians. I'm really, really happy to see you. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, I love your paper, but we need to do some updating. Um, yeah. So I got a lot of comments on this. I could give you 20 minutes of comments. We don't have the time. Uh, Volodymyr says that this period that we're in now is one of the most significant in U.S.-Ukrainian relations, and that is a spot-on observation. Um, I have a lot of beefs with what you've written. I think you see the world um, too much through the, the, the narrow prism of Washington and not enough through Kiev. And maybe I see the world too much through Kiev, uh, and, and that might be a fair critique. So on the first paper, our first uh, problem I have with your paper is you say that there was no complete consensus as to what Russia was really doing there. And many U.S. partners, including its uh, closest allies, were convinced. Some of that is true and some of that is false. So I would say in the U.S. government on the intelligence community side and in the White House, they were convinced. You go back and look at the new reports that have come out from the Washington Post. There was, there was uh, with people who had eyes on the intelligence, there was a consensus. Uh, and the analytical, the expert community that I just slammed, they were all wrong. There were three of us who said Russia was going in, and I was one of those people. But you know what? No one likes Old Testament prophets. They just cut off our hands. So you know, you you get no raises by being right. It, you know, it's it's not it's not a pleasant being right. Um, you're right, though. Many U.S. partners, including the closest allies, were unconvinced. And I think you should specific be more specific there, Volodymyr. Say Western European allies were unconvinced, not Eastern European allies. So I, I would encourage you in this paper to be as specific as possible. Uh, next paragraph, you have a section about the several months prior to February 24th, 2022, the day that, that Putin went in. You need to go back to the April buildup in 2021 and, and uh, flesh out that, that history as well. Uh, it's clear that Russia had decided to go to war uh, in 2021. So I think that needs to be reflected in your paper. Um, your analysis that there was a lack of proper trust between Washington and Kiev is true, but it, it's missing a lot. It was not just Trump. Zelensky did not want war. He did not want war because it would destroy the Ukrainian economy and it would uh, make it very, very difficult for him to be reelected. Uh, re I think you need to also talk about his psychology and who he is. That's a big part of, of why he didn't believe uh, why he didn't believe Washington and take the intelligence assessment seriously. We were there in February and. Uh, we said, do you disagree with the intelligence assessment? No, I don't disagree with the intelligence assessment. There are 300,000 Russian troops surrounding Ukraine on three sides. Okay, I don't believe they're going to go in. So he didn't believe it. And I, I so please unpack that section a little bit more. There's a lot more to it than just Trump. He's easy to beat up, but let, let's, let's, uh, I, I would flesh that out. Second point, <clears throat> uh, you say that Washington started to sound the alarm in October 2021. Washington started to sound the alarm in April of 2021. And uh, Zelensky didn't want it to be true. So go back and acknowledge what happened in April. That's a really important um, a piece. 
I think you're placing too much attention on the U.S. response. Uh, and Kiev, you know, Kiev is an actor, and you don't acknowledge Kiev enough uh, in, in your paper. Um, let's see. Um, on page three, uh, you have a section that says, was there time? What could have been done? This is a discussion to be had in the coming years. That being said, the U.S. administration was not just limiting itself to issuing warnings. So, Volodymyr, my friend, I would say uh, there was time. Uh, we knew this was coming. Uh, the intelligence shows that we knew it was coming. Maybe we sat on our hands, and you can definitely critique uh, Kiev and Washington for not doing more. But I think the discussion is we should be having this discussion uh, in Washington and Kiev now um, about uh, did we get ahead? Did we treat the, the intelligence we had uh, properly? Uh, and did we do enough? And, and uh, in my view, the Ukrainians did not do enough. I had insane conversations in February with everyone in the government, and they said, it ain't going to happen. Uh, and you guys didn't protect your northern border. So I hope that those discussions will come out very soon. Uh, on page uh, four, you, you have a discussion about American politics. And it's very good, but it would be strengthened if it were more specific. So you there, say there are certain cracks that might endanger the support for Ukraine. And you talk about the upcoming elections. Please get more specific. So there's polling from Morning Call that shows that the number of Republicans who think that uh, the U.S. is doing too much for Ukraine has doubled. Uh, to from 13 to 26 percent uh, from uh, February to, to May, uh, and there's more polling that I can send you. But please be more specific; it'll make your argument even stronger. And in that paragraph, it would uh, be highly strengthened if you could speculate more about what the elections mean. And I can give you some more information. We can have a, a conversation about it. Next paragraph, you uh, mentioned the Lindley's Law. Uh, I would urge you not to focus on that. The Lindley's Law is a nothing burger, and it amounts to nothing. Uh, it, it's, it makes Congress feel good. It's not going to amount to any kind of new assistance. Um, the last section, you have a great paragraph on the interagency. Uh, and again, it would be um, stronger if you make it more specific and sharpen it. There are three decision makers in this town on Ukraine. It's the president, the national security advisor, and the deputy national security advisor. Those are the three big decision makers, and they're going to make the decisions on more high Mars and on whether we're going to send long range rockets. Uh, the State Department, uh, unfortunately, is not playing a very vigorous role, and you're right that they are uh, more robust in their response, and DOD has been ro robust, but the problem, and you, you say it clearly, is the National Security Council that's been opting for a more cautious approach. But I, if, if you uh, make it more specific, it'll be even better. I think uh, on page five, you have a section you said, uh, if you knew about this imminent invasion, why did you, Washington, not provide us with more uh, massive supply of weapons in the months coming up to the start of the invasion? I love that question. And that's a great question that should be asked now. And that's a question for Mr. Biden and, and, uh, and Sullivan. Uh, and then one point you made in your, uh, in your remarks, you talked about the new security arrangements. Uh, and I hate to say this, but there's no such thing as Budapest II. We already let you down with Budapest I. Uh, the best thing you're going to get is the Israeli option. So thank you so much. It's an excellent paper. It can get even better. And I look thank forward you, to it. Thank you, Great. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. So thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, like I said, a lot packed in there. I think we have a lot of material for discussion. Um, but because we also want to make sure we get plenty of input from um, the uh, audience as well, uh, what I'd like to do is maybe collect um, you know, just a few uh, questions or comments, if you could be very brief. Um, I think we'll go to about um, 11.30. Um, so that will kind of give us the full amount of time dedicated to this panel originally, and then we'll just kind of move directly to the next panel. Um, and then I'll come back to the um, uh, the panelists. And I, I, I have Alexi on my list, but maybe I'll ask you to just give your comment when your turn comes up. That's okay. Um, okay, so uh, let's let's start with uh, Ira. If you could just introduce yourself, please. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ira Busigina. I'm a visiting scholar at the Data Center at Harvard. And I have a, I, can you hear me? Yes, you did, right? Uh, I have a question to Vladimir Dubovic. And this is, uh, you mentioned two times uh, the resilience of the, of the Ukraine or of the Ukrainian society. I think it's a very important question. And you say you were, uh, you were yourself surprised by the resilience. So, uh, and I don't think many nations in the world could be so resilient uh, against the aggression like that. So, and this is again, this is very unexpected. So can you please say what are the sources of the Ukrainian resilience? Because it's also the question which is very important for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Uh, 
I'm as, uh, you, as you wait for the microphone, please, so that people online can hear. There's one coming behind here. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Um, I keep hearing President Biden saying there will be severe consequences uh, for any use of nuclear weapons uh, in Ukraine. And I wonder if you guys could flesh that out a little bit. I keep hearing severe consequences, but not a single particular. My solution is to take over the Southern Imperials and return them to Japan. But uh, that, there may be better ideas than that. Also, please note, we have not crossed over into the use of thermobaric weapons, which are like mini nukes, but they don't irradiate. That could be the next step. Thank you. And then um, Mark and the Thank you, Mark Kramer from Harvard. Um, Alexi, the, uh, you mentioned both in your draft memo and also here that um, the start of the war had increased support for democracy, um, and it's evident in your figures. Um, could you uh, just elaborate on that? What exactly, did you indicate to people what you meant by democracy? Um, uh, did you try to uh, flesh out what they, thought of democracy. Also, why do you think it went up? Because usually war is not the most conducive time for democracy, it's the opposite. So um, if you could, and then Volodymyr, just very quickly, um, the, the question about leading up to the war and that the administration had thought it was coming and why they didn't supply far more weapons, I think it's a classic security dilemma in which uh, you know John Hart's uh, uh, Glenn Snyder, Robert Jervis, about that if you take steps to provide for your security, in this case to acquire weapons from the United States, do you in turn increase the likelihood that the war will occur and that it accelerate the timetable for it? Okay, I think we have plenty now uh, to uh, go on for the discussion. So um, I think we should just go back in the order that the um, panelists presented uh, for their responses. And I'd ask, uh, probably you're not going to be able to address everything uh, that was raised. So just maybe you know pick out the most important things you want to say in response to the comments, other presentations, or the questions. Um, and uh, if you could try to limit yourself maybe to four minutes each, um, that will give us time for another round. And then um, we can continue the discussion. So uh, let's turn to uh, uh, Vladimir. Can you hear us? Sir? Oops, it's frozen right now. All right, well, let's um, maybe while we get. Uh, oh, okay, all right, good. Okay. Were you able to hear everything? Um, in that case, I mean, let, let's, let's wait. Oh, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, 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 we're good. Right, thank you, thank you. Okay, you want to take like kind of four minutes to respond to the most important things or the kind of make the most important things you want to say in response to the comments. Oh, unstable internet, unfortunately. All right. Um, so actually, well, let me, let's, let's wait for a minute and hopefully the internet stabilizes and let's go maybe we'll go to Paulina uh, first and then we'll come back to you once we get that uh, connection sorted out. Okay, I might uh, start uh, briefly from uh, Melinda's questions, right? Or uh, I should uh, just do whatever, whatever you want. I think yeah. kind of the four, okay. or just kind of whatever yeah. the main points you'd like to make okay. in response. Um, to well, but for the logical and then the, uh, what Putin can gain by using tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine, I think that the main aim is to, to practice coercion. So the main um, function of nuclear deterrence and nuclear weapons here for Putin is its political function, is to coerce. Uh, the West to stop helping Ukraine as much and to coerce Ukraine to sign the, uh, the treaty to signify the annexation of the territory. So uh, I think that the main idea is that because you know Putin is really uh, frequently exploiting the threat of using nuclear weapons, uh, and at some point, to be credible, he should prove that he, he can do this, that he has enough resolve to do this. This is why the uh, probability of nuclear weapons somehow going. I can't say it because I don't think that he wants to do it because uh, for Putin, he's a child of the Cold War when um, 
there was a very common idea that the only use of nuclear weapons uh, can result in the third world war and nothing in between. However, at some point, as far as uh, it's a game of a chicken, if mobilization won't help, if there will be a further pressure from Ukraine and further you know, uh, trying to take uh, back territories, he can use it, but it will be the weapons of last resort, because if it won't work, if that nuclear um, blast won't work, then he would lose the only reliable Trump, the Trump of deterrence and the Trump of nuclear courage. So he will exploit it as much as possible, and when he lose it, uh, use it, then he would that last Trump. Because if it won't work, and it may not work, then it means that Russia has nothing to, to confront the whole West and Ukraine. Um, so um, um, where and how, of course, it's a matter of uh, exploitation and whatever. But there were a lot of um, uh, researchers and uh, politicians and probably people uh, involved in discussing what would happen, starting from uh, the blast over the Black Sea to show that Russia can do something uh, to using one uh, kiloton nuclear warhead, which is pretty nothing because, you know, the Hiroshima type of bomb was 15 kilotons, so one kiloton would not probably work. So on my point of view, if he would uh, dare to do this, uh, he would use something bigger and he would use it to have the more, uh, the bigger effect. It won't happen uh, somewhere over the Black Sea. It would not be one kiloton. It would be somewhere in, or against Ukrainian troops, but with a lot of Ukrainian troops to have the effect of the battlefield. Or it will be the object will be some kind of city. Uh, maybe not the major city, but uh, the city which is recognizable to show that they can go further. Uh, because they want to perform pressure. And to perform pressure, it should be very, very bright. Unfortunately, as all uh, you know, terror strategies. It should it is it should be based on the very serious psychological effect and the very serious psychological effect of which only with this. Uh, I hope he's not looking. Um, yeah. So um, they. Um, yes, and and coming back to the last uh, to, to to the messages because my time is uh, yes. coming, uh, you know, bending up. Um, as far as uh, commenting the President Biden's um, uh, quote about the uh, severe consequences, right? He never he never said what kind of consequences. So it can be from um, you know performing the strike over that uh, military forces who use that nuclear weapon against uh, Ukraine, the conventional strike, of course, to providing Ukraine with assets to perform that kind of strike. Or it can be some economic sanctions like switching off Russia from any kind of visa and other stuff. So uh, there is no clear definition, and uh, uh, it's calculated ambiguity to show that uh, all options are on the table. Um, so I think that it can be whatever, depending on what Russia would do. But again, it can be different uh, type of options. My time is over. For now, yeah. Maybe <laughs> you can save other okay. things for, hopefully, we'll have another round. You can work some other comments in then. Thank you. Um, do we have uh, Vladimir back? Vladimir, Dubovic? yes, I'm here. Ah, great. Okay, so right, wonderful. Thank you. So, so first of all, many thanks to uh, to uh, Melinda for her comments, and uh, they were really useful. I would definitely use them uh, uh, in uh, uh, you know in revising in memo. Uh, I think the one uh, the claim that I'm uh, spending too much time on a U.S. perspective is is, is almost always true. Uh, you know, I'm an Americanist, and my main field of study is U.S. foreign policy. So when I write about U.S. foreign relations, it's primarily about U.S. as a leading actor, and then Kiev responding, reacting, and so on. So that's a very valid comment, and I'll try to be to make my memo more balanced. Uh, on other things, so we can have a discussion. I don't think there was a consensus in D.C. before February 24th. Uh, definitely not in the late months of last year. I think uh, there was uh, understanding that it's looking like Russia is preparing for massive invasion, but there was no no clear like hundred percent no guarantee or sure like no one took it for granted that they actually will invade. So, and that's but was reflected actually in private in in a, in, a, in, a, in a public statements by Biden and others. So and uh, yes, in terms of the question about the arms, why they were not given in bigger numbers to us and more serious arms prior to February twenty first. And that connects also to the question I received from Mark Kramer. Uh, what, what, what I mentioned in my memo, and I can reiterate it again, 
is that Zelensky is using this argument. Uh, you know, I'm not saying myself that I think it was a mistake by Washington not to give arms uh, before February 21st, because I'm buying conceptual background of uh, trying not to push Russia to escalate uh, by Biden people. So I understand why. But Zelensky is using it actively, and he is getting a lot of support among Ukrainians. So it's a popular view. Like, why are you criticizing us and our president for not uh, uh, heeding the call from Washington? If you were so sure about this invasion being imminent, why didn't you just uh, rain on us all of those high marks, you know, in the months coming before the February 21st? So it's more not about my view, uh, but more about the view of Zelensky and how his line of defense, how he's defending himself. He's building this line of defense. Uh, ever since those publications uh, came out in uh, primarily in Washington Post. So, and uh, yes, uh, that's uh, in terms of what Melinda has said. In terms of questions, uh, in terms of Mark, I've already actually answered that, uh, that uh, yes, I understand how the acceleration of the timetable works or escalation, how it works. Uh, but uh, a lot of people here in Ukraine are really uh, still upset, uh, grateful about all the arms we received since February 21st, but still upset why didn't we get more of them before February 20th, even though we got some of those, like stingers and, of course, javelins. And that was a decisive factor, by the way, in the first uh, uh, successes of the Ukrainian army near Kiev, under Kiev, and Kiev suburbs. Without those, those javelins, one, one, might, one might argue with all our resilience and heroism, Kiev might be taken. So anyway, uh, in terms of the great question on the sources of Ukrainian resilience, we're mostly focused on, on uh, mentioning different uh, examples of this resilience. But the question of sources of Ukrainian resilience is something which is, would validate the big course or maybe a big volume or something like that. So I'll just name them quickly. I think, first of all, it's just a self-survival, really, because a lot of people are fighting against extermination. And that's from February 24th, with the scale of invasion, and the Ukrainians saw it as a serious thing. You know, it's not a low intensity conflict. You know, it's a proxy war in Donbass that we had for eight years. So they want to exterminate us, you know, not just the state, but Ukraine. So we need to fight back, therefore. Then there was a tradition of Maidans, well-prepared Ukrainians were well-prepared to fight for their freedoms, was to Maidans. Uh, open political system, uh, you know, and uh, democratic tradition here in this country, frankly, and uh, quite a big historical, uh, you know, kind of struggle for freedom that the generations of Ukrainians had. And it was coming from in, in genes, you know, really from generation to generation, we need to stand up, we need to fight. Uh, one final, maybe a couple of final things is that we had experience of war after all ongoing since 2014. So that was helpful in that respect to military, at least it wasn't necessarily you know, totally something and expected they knew what to do when Russians came in big numbers. And uh, finally, uh, I think Zelensky was a factor, you know, and the government working and uh, working and functioning and trains running on, on schedule, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, taxes being collected, uh, uh, fires being put down, you know, surgeons doing operations under the bombing and everything like that. Uh, it's part, it, it, it's, it's a kind of a system where you have it as examples of resilience, but also when people see others do it, they also become resilient. So it's kind of a consolidation that you, that you saw, but it's a great question. I, I think I would love to see someone exploring this uh, in the bigger lens, in the greater lens. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Um, Alexei. Yes, thank you. On the question of resilience, since 2014, we sociologists, we were providing the data showing to the Western scholars and the expert community that it doesn't matter who are you in Ukraine? Ethnic, language, confession. We are all Ukrainian political nation. And Russian speakers and ethnic Russians who are living in Ukraine, and Crimean Tatars, and Jews, they are fighting for Ukraine. Okay, so this is one of the source of resilience, which in the West, you know, is still misunderstood. Yesterday, uh, a colleague of mine asked the question, what is the language spoken in Ukrainian army? Do you know? Folks, does it matter? No, Ukrainian and Russian. So again, I visited uh, two weeks ago, I visited also some of the nations which some in the West are calling far right, which is not true, like Azov or right sector. And again, a lot of them are speaking uh, Russian language. There are Jews there. And uh, for example, if you have a territorial defense brigade from uh, Dnipro, 
or Zaporizhia. Guess what language you would be preferring to speak. So, it, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so this is, we have this Ukrainian political mission. This is very, very important. Uh, on the question about democracy, thank you. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to elaborate because I have figures on that as well. Ukrainians for many years also, they are at the same time in favor of democracy, but they wanted strong hand. Okay, and especially in time of war, there are figures which shows that Ukrainians, 58 Ukrainians are in favor of strong hand and that they agree with the limits on their freedoms. Now, in time, during martial war, I believe that's understandable. Okay, because we are sacrificing some of our rights. Uh, including we are muted in criticizing the government. We're still criticizing, but we are muted, you know. We postpone our differences for uh, for the time after war. But if you ask at the same time the basic questions, are you in favor of democracy or some other means? Most people are in favor of democracy. In this polling, we didn't specify by what, uh, what democracy, what democracy is. So it, it was just, you know, basic, basic questions. That's how people understood. It. But I think this is very, very important because this is one of the uh, yeah, sources of resilience because Ukrainians believe in democracy. And many Ukrainians criticized Zelensky before the war, myself included. We are saying, okay, now we are muted. We know the problem, we will discuss it later. After the end of the so, and I believe that uh, yeah, this is principle to which opposition stick and most experts stick as well. Nevertheless, even in time of war, we have unprecedented level of freedom. Even under martial law, again, so we have opposition channels, we have possibility for discussion, we have possibility to criticize the government. Now, several issues for debate with uh, my colleague Tatiana. Uh, first of all, again, regarding uh, Ukrainians are not fighting for the collapse of the Russian state. This is not our official aim. Many Ukrainians would be happy to see Russia collapse, but it's up to Russia. And this is not the aim. Not officially, and we understand that this is not to up to you. What is important for us actually is not collapse of the Russian state, but Russia to cease be imperialist. That's important. How will it happen? happen? This is the open question. So I would say here it's not zero 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 sum game. We are realistic, we are pragmatic. Okay. Now regarding means. Uh, do not share responsibility for the failure of Minsk on Russia, Ukraine, and the West. We see right now because Russia canceled Minsk agreements by its brutal aggression. It wasn't the intention of Russia to implement Minsk agreements from the very beginning. They only tried the best ways to undermine Ukrainian state and to conquer Ukrainian state. Finally, on the issue of the attitudes towards Ukrainians in the occupied regions. Again, there are different expressions. I wouldn't trust very shoot, you know, she's very talkative. I would follow uh, what Prime Minister suggested is the kind of official line. And basically, Ukrainians understand that we are not going to punish people who are under occupation. We understand they, they are striving for their survival they are hostages, but who we are going to punish? Those who try to impose occupation and who is helping Russians to introduce terror methods uh, used for this occupation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, Tatiana. Yes, uh, I, I, I just answered that. Uh, regarding on the um, statement about the war. I just can quote uh, the statement of Ukrainian public official. Maybe if uh, um, they say it publicly, for example, Danilov or Resnikov, being a minister of head of security council, we can trust that it's maybe speculation, of course, but it may be the public position. Uh, 
Regarding the Minsk, uh, I didn't, I don't want to discuss uh, this topic now because it's very broad, but uh, just uh, not uh, to settle the conflict, but to keep it a little bit frozen, but not settled, it, it is not very good position for Ukraine. If Minsk was bad, I agree that it's not the best agreement and not in Ukraine interest. Why we did not propose any other model of conflict settlement? We can see that Karabakh, the same situation, conflict was not settled, it appeared every time. It hears about Transnistria, Transnistria. It also not settled conflict. So uh, we uh, should fear danger to, to keep the conflict unresolved, and it sh would shot in any time. And uh, what was uh, the source comment? That you, you did not like in my democracy. I just disagreed uh, in, in a democratic in a democratic uh, way. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to ask you uh, about opinion pool, which was conducted maybe not by your organization, but other organization when Ukrainian prefer to uh, not to allow to publicly criticize government and Ukrainians uh, respondents prefer to have a strong hand uh, during the war. So I would say that uh, the public opinion uh, during the time of war are not very uh, reliable because uh, there is self-censorship and uh, emotion of people and uh, two different uh, opinion pools, different organization no, no. can bring you to different, different no. results. Actually, maybe just uh, there is a question uh, online exactly on this point, which is uh, to Alexei, which is how do you explain why Ukrainians do not support the strengthening of the president's powers, which would seem reasonable at the time of war? So maybe if you want to take a minute to no, no. comment on no, that, no, and then we look, can go look, back. There's no contradiction. There's no contradiction. Again, if you ask the question, you know, would you like to look, we introduced martial law. So actually, president has extended power. That's right. Okay. But Ukrainians do not want to sacrifice their freedom. So they understand it's necessary to do in time of war. But still, look at the reality. Even if you do not trust polls, look at the reality as how Ukrainians behave. So I think this is the explanation. And I disagree with Tatiana, but OK, this is academic debate where democracy is so. OK. And I think there's no time to continue. Yeah, let's get, let's get some new uh, rounds of input, but just briefly to update people who are just coming in now, we had a fire alarm, which uh, uh, basically set us off track in the schedule. So we had a long interruption. So we're extending this panel to 1130. Um, and then we're actually going to just have a quick five minute transition to the next panel. Um, so no extended coffee break. So that's just why we're at where we're at. So we do have time for one last round of, of questions. Um, let's see. So yes. Uh, uh, just identify yourself, please. Uh, Ray Taylor from um, the UK. I'm in Slovakia. I've just been three months in Ukraine. Uh, this one's for Vladimir online. Um, uh, Melinda was suggesting to you that the. Thank you. Melinda was suggesting to you that uh, in her feedback, um, which was really interesting, by the way, uh, it makes me want to read the paper, um, uh, that between February and May, I think it was, there was a drop in the support. Uh, the, the more American, there's increased. More Americans were saying that that America was helping too much. So it strikes me that there's an important media uh, piece to be done here in DC and, and, and in the US media. Um, so uh, is anybody taking the lead in that? And, uh, because as a foreigner, I can't do that, but I can support and volunteer, which I would love to do. Okay, uh, let's see. Next question I had uh, yeah, right here below the clock. And Uh, I have a question to all the speakers who would like to uh, address it with regard to the recent developments on the recognition of uh, by Russia uh, of annexation of uh, additional territories of Ukraine. And President Zelensky 
uh, commenting on that on the eve uh, of these developments was uh, referring to 2014 and uh, Crimea annexation, saying this is no longer 2014, it is 2022. International community has learned its lessons. We have learned our lessons, so the response will be different. So my question to uh, the esteemed panelists, uh, do you agree that the international community has learned its lessons and the response will, different, will be different? And if so, in what way? Thank you. Okay. Then right next. Hi, um, Augustus Salzona, a Christian nationalist from occupied Maryland. Uh, <laughs> the question is uh, this in terms of uh, Christian nationalism as classically defined. Uh, what do you see as the outcome, at least for uh, Christians in the Ukraine? And by the way, my sympathies uh, go out to the Ukrainian people, regardless of their politics or religion. You know, what's happening? But but the uh, uh, question: uh, What do you see the impact of uh, uh, the impact on Christianity, whether Orthodox or uh, other forms? Of, I'm a Catholic. Uh, in the Ukraine, uh, regardless of what ends up happening uh, in terms of the annexation. Uh, maybe another panel will address that later. Okay. Thanks, Peter Rutland, Wesley. I have a question for Paulina or anybody else. Are the Ukrainian or Russian armed forces training for uh, fighting in nuclear conditions with tactical nuclear weapons? Yeah. We'll go this side. I'll just take a couple more and then people can get to as many as they want. So, uh, yeah, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, um, maybe first, uh, I, I'm Emil Juraev from Bishkek. Um, and uh, my first point is maybe to Paulina, but maybe uh, others as well. When we talk about uh, Putin's criteria for, for example, turning to nuclear weapons, or actually for any other decision that Putin makes based on his pre, uh, previously said narratives and talks. Uh, are, we, are we giving too much meaning to what he says? Indeed, it looks like he can make up his mind on whatever he wants and then uh, backwardly, uh, he can justify it with any language he wants. So essentially uh, in thinking, in trying to just understand when, under what conditions he might use weapons of mass destruction. I think it's really, uh, it's more about uh, the circumstances than uh, whatever Putin has said in the past. Um, so that's to the question of nukes. And the other is, uh, again, uh, similarly, about uh, democracy to continuing uh, Mark Kramer's question. Putin wants to, in much of his talks recently, he Putin wants to depict it as the weakness of democracy and the strength of whatever he would like to call it. He doesn't call it anything in Russia, but he uh, wants to present the Europeans, not so much Ukraine itself, but Europeans, the Western collective in Zapad, as about to bog down and just give up because democracies uh, do, not, uh, do not want to live under... Uh, bad circumstances. Uh, for politicians, it matters what people feel when they are left without heating, without gas, etc. Then, so democracy is weak in that spot. But at the same time, he plays democracy when by conducting this uh, uh, farcical referendum in Donbass. Uh, and the question is, if you're asking Donbass people whether they want to join, why don't you ask Russians as well whether they want to take the annexed territories in? Uh, so what's the other, how about the other side? So, so are we giving uh, Putin the right sort of answer or the right sort of uh, discussion when it comes to weaknesses or strengths of democracy? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think that's all the time we're gonna have for questions. So um, I wanted to leave uh, each panelist uh, two minutes, uh, which will take us to the uh, half hour. Um, and maybe just we can reverse the order. Um, that's okay, and we'll, so we'll start with uh, Tatiana and then go to Alexi, then Paulina, and then uh, Volodymyr. So, I mean, if there's anything, yeah. I don't know. I, I would add a question returning to the previous set of questions because this last set was not exactly to me. I would add a question about resilience. So if we would like to conduct academic research 
on this matter, we would compare the social structure of Ukrainian army and the Russian army. And we can see that Ukrainian army, in particular, who are volunteers, are belonging to the middle class, to educated people, and they know what they want. And they compare what they would get if Russia occupied territory. And uh, uh, it is not very scientific, but I would quote uh, the statement from Facebook. Uh, a guy wrote uh, that um, in uh, 1920, Ukraine compromised with Soviets, but in uh, 10 years, uh, in uh, 15 years, they received Holodomor. So we clearly know what Russian brings to us, and uh, for us it's very bad. So it's the source of our reason. Okay, thank you. Um, Alexei. Uh, okay, I think the international community draws the lesson. It's the lessons from what happened and what's going on right now actually shows uh, masks off. Uh, that's why we see the strong reaction from international community. Uh, what is needed, definitely, is of sanctions, more support to Ukraine, yeah. more weapons, and also more support, more support. I believe it's very important to work with China, to work with India, uh, because they, they have their own achievable of communication with Putin as well. Uh, regarding religious situation, uh, look, uh, there are religious freedoms in Ukraine. Uh, if you're talking about situation within Orthodox Church, definitely uh, what Russians are doing, what Russian Orthodox Church is doing, uh, weakens their position in Ukraine. So the, the number of parishes, parishes which are moving from uh, Moscow Patriarchate to Orthodox Church of Ukraine, but still, I think uh, some people would stick to to or still stick to uh, you know this part of Russian Orthodox Church, which is in Ukraine, because they are taking now more nuanced position. So they are saying we are independent. Uh, you may not mention uh, Kirill in, in the praying the, his name. So they are, you know, more, uh, they are demonstrating that they are not under full Moscow control. But definitely it's a blow to this part of the church. What is interesting, the interesting situation is about authority of, uh, the approval of uh, what Pope of the Roman see. You know, so we are Catholic, we have Catholics in Ukraine, we are Catholic, everything is fine. But the position of the Pope, he's, uh, it's kind of, okay, we are for peace. You know, just have, let's have peace. Uh, I do not denounce Russia. So it led to decreased popularity of Pope in, in Ukraine. So we'll see what will happen. Personal, his personal popularity. I'm not talking about Catholic Church or Greek Catholic. And regarding Islam, the Muslims, what is important? You know, since 2015, I believe that Muslim countries who are united in the organization of Islamic Federation, they didn't react properly to what happened to Crimean Tatars in Ukraine. And I think this is very important argument. And what Putin now is doing, he is sending, you know, whom ethnic minority, Muslims, Buddhist minorities, and others to die at the Ukrainian front. So I believe when we are talking global south to Muslim countries is very important to mention this thing. And finally, regarding the democracy in democracy, in, well, what Putin is saying, you know, it's just, you know, a propaganda. But definitely, you know, his plan is, yes, to blackmail Europe with energy crisis in winter, to use far left, far right, to split. That's his idea. And I'm often again asked the question, what Ukrainians will do in case of this or that result of the election in the United States, Italy, and other countries? What shall we do? We'll continue to fight. Maybe in a more difficult situation, but we'll continue to fight. Thank you. Uh, Pauline? Yeah. Uh, 
Um, well, um, are Ukrainian forces training for uh, against uh, you know uh, nuclear weapons attack? Actually, I'm not in the armed forces, and the, if they do, the information is uh, hidden because it would cause panic, of course. But as far as uh, the information of how to protect yourself in case of nuclear attack is spreading all over network, uh, like social networks in Russia and as well as in Ukraine. I have a guess that the probably, but it's just my guess. As for the Putin's uh, you know, speeches, whatever he says, I think that we should listen to him because his aim is not to use nuclear weapons. His aim is to use deterrence and deterrence means in the way he says. So he's, the only aim is to deter, to coerce, um, Ukraine and the West to do what he says. So this is the main thing why why he says what he says. This is not something he's uh, you know he's out of his mind. He's in his mind. He's rationally trying to persuade not to go further. Uh, the question how he reacts, of course, this is an open question and it, it relates to any leader. But I am sure he's very much uh, concise when he's speaking about nuclear weapons. I can't say that he's determined to use it, but he he's giving the warning. And we should listen to the warning because uh, this is a sort of uh, how to, it practices deterrence. This is why we should not disregard what he said because this is the ultimate way we can get signals from the Russia regarding its uh, possible use of nuclear weapons. This is why I think that we should listen to him because he's the ultimate instant like the body who makes up the decision. Um, I think that's it. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, to wrap us up, uh, Vladimir. Sure, really quickly then on two issues. First of all, on uh, why there was a drop in support of Ukraine in US. Uh, there's tons of literature, you can look at it. And I mean, it's a combination of different factors and uh, factions within American society. Uh, some of them just non-interventionism, you know, really like we shouldn't be deciding the, the fate of all conflicts and resolving all those conflicts around the world. So just let's stay away from it. Libertarian movement uh, in many ways. Uh, the Trump's legacy, who actually said Russia is not that bad and Ukraine is actually poor and corrupt and bad country. They don't like him, Ukrainians, I mean. So that legacy, so the Trumpist wing uh, of the Republican Party is the most important uh, factor here. But of course, there is something on the extreme left as well, who are just anti-imperialists and uh, who say that, well, we shouldn't give weapons to Ukraine because weapons prolong war, things like that. So it's a combination of factors. Some people say we gave Ukraine too much. Others say, well, actually, probably not. Uh, others also say that uh, Ukrainians are doing fine right now. So let's stop supporting them because uh, Ukrainian state is going to survive anyhow. So why send more weapons? So it's a combination of factors we'll see. Uh, I think there will be a substantial level of support within the American society, broadly speaking, and political elite as well in the coming months, uh, and then we'll see. On the other question of reaction to annexation uh, proclaimed today, I think that uh, uh, Ukraine will fight, obviously, there's no doubt about that. So the bigger question is then what will West do? And uh, will be will be covered by Putin's statements about nuclear weapons and stuff like that? We'll see. I mean, we shouldn't be ignoring Putin, I agree, but uh, at the same time, we sometimes tend to pay too much attention to what he says. But uh, should we ignore him? Angela Merkel said the other day that uh, if you do it, you do it uh, at your own peril. So maybe we shouldn't. After all, he's been truthful. He said, I want to do away with the Ukrainian nations. There is no such thing. I want to do away with the Ukrainian state. And he tried to do it. So maybe if he's saying now that he is not bluffing about nuclear weapons, we should take him for his word. But again, from that particular decision, if he makes a decision, OK, he's probably going to use WMD, then what do we do? Again, do we cower? Do we just uh, retract? Uh, do we, you know, uh, kind of retreat and so on? Or do we actually pressure even more uh, to, to make him understand that there will be a devastating uh, answer if he does so? Uh, this is definitely not 2014 when a lot of people, even in this current American administration, understand and agree now that they haven't been decisive enough back then in supporting Ukraine. If they were, maybe there would be no 2022, but now they understand they need to be doing more to support Ukraine. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And just uh, before we kind of give a, a, a hearty round of applause to our, our panelists, let me just uh, make clear again, we had a, a fire alarm delay, which kind of got us off schedule. So we're just gonna make a quick transition now to the next panel.
Um, and uh, that panel will run until 1.15, at which point we'll have a half hour instead of an hour for lunch, and then we should be back on schedule for the uh, afternoon. Um, but uh, I think this has been a fabulous uh, panel, really interesting discussion. So I want to thank all the uh, panelists and our discussion who had to leave um, for leading us in it. And um, uh, so uh, please join me. Thank you.